I remember the last time I was in New York, riding a jam-packed F train into Manhattan. The train was rumbling through a hot tunnel and it was stuffed with poorly groomed protoplasm. A woman nearby was eating chicken nuggets and licking her fingers. Some other guy had all too obviously never met a bar of soap, and the clown behind me kept bumping me with his backpack. I mean, I just wanted to throttle them all. But here's the thing. We don't like people, but we do like people. Humans have evolved to be together. We're perpetually stuck in the crowded subway car of humanity. So the question is, how did we get here? I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. There just aren't enough backwoods cabins for all 7 billion of us to escape to. But, you know, you wouldn't want to anyway, at least not long term. Humans are social, yes, but more than that, we are driven to care for one another, even those outside our family, and even at a cost to ourselves. Why is that? This is Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute. And in this episode, from the sharing of knowledge to the powerful hormone oxytocin, some of the reasons that the Homo sapiens motto is, let's stick together. What makes us social and even what drives moral behavior is inescapably entwined with the question of what makes us human. And while we were mulling over how to approach that subject, a book from the UK caught our eye and it looked as if it had the perfect solution. The Book of Humans, the story of how we became us. I mean, you can't get more big picture than that. But when the same book by the same author appeared on bookshelves in the U.S., the title had completely morphed. The word human had merged with animal to become humanimal, followed by an alternative subtitle, How Homo Sapiens Became Nature's Most Paradoxical Creature, A New Evolutionary History. Well, it sounded like the publisher is pitching to different markets, and perhaps Americans prefer longer subtitles. But we suspect that the author was grappling with big evolutionary questions that don't fit easily into pithy phrases. What is human exceptionalism? How are we different from animals? How are we the same as animals? What is the sort of conundrum of the human condition as an animal? I'm Dr. Adam Rutherford, and I'm a geneticist and science writer. In the book, he asks how we went from being an average ape to one capable of fashioning tools, art, science, and philosophy, and how we define what makes us human, even though we're now aware that many behaviors, from tool use to the cultural transmission of ideas, are not unique to us. Adam, we have here in the studio piles and piles of science books devoted to identifying what makes us human. And they usually have subtitles along the lines of how our brains make us human, how language makes us human, fire made us human. It strikes me that this is all an attempt to identify a single characteristic that differentiates us from the other critters on the planet. What do you think of this approach? (laughs) <laughs> so that that was really the motivation for writing this book in the first place, because I think that it's obviously a question which has preoccupied human thought for several thousand years. And a lot of people make careers out of saying it's this thing. It's, you know, it's communication, it's speech, it's fire. Recently, in the last year, some people suggested that it's our experimenting with hallucinogenic drugs. And I find these singular, simple narratives fully unsatisfying. These sort of uniqueness theories always fall apart because that's just not a reflection of how evolution works. It's not a reflection of human behavior. It's not a reflection of the amount of time that's been involved in this process of getting from there to here for us. That it's never one thing. When I was a kid, you know, in in grade school, they used to tell us, well, what makes us human is the fact that we use tools Uh, They don't say that very often anymore. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the kind of tools that, for example, New Caledonian crows use. Right. So that was Darwin who first suggested that tool use was a sort of definitionally and unique human characteristic. But we now know that literally thousands of species that are not humans are obligate tool users, meaning that, you know, they're utterly dependent on tools. So we haven't shared an ancestor with Caledonian crows for something like... I don't know, 250 million years. 
But they're super smart birds. They have super densely packed cortices in their brains. And they more and more we're seeing that they not only use sticks to do things like catch grubs, but they also have been seen to forge tools. So actually, you know, bend them into hooks because obviously a hook is a much better tool for catching a fat grub than a straight spear. Uh, and we also have seen them in experimental situations using tools to get other tools. So that's called meta tool use. So if you put a nice stick just out of reach through bars, but give them a crappy stick, then the crows will use the first stick to get hold of the second stick. Now that is very, very sophisticated tool use. You also write about hawks that pick up burning sticks. Maybe you could describe what they're doing there. I mean, it sounds like fire bugging. Right. So this is another sort of Darwinian idea. He also suggested in The Descent of Man that control of fire was was unique to humans. We now know that that is not correct. But until 2017, at least in the scientific literature, it was unknown whether any animal other than us could start fires. Now, it turns out that Aboriginal Australians knew this behaviour maybe for thousands of years, but it's only been written up in, in the scientific literature in the last couple of years. And it's three different species of raptor, of hawk, black kites being the most commonly observed ones, and they sit near the edge of the annual savannah fires in the bush in Western Australia. And they'll pick out a nice stick that's smouldering or that's actually on fire with their beaks or, or more likely with their claws. And then they'll fly away over a natural or a man-made fire barrier and then they'll go and drop it in a dry bit of brush. And they set a new fire and then they'll go and perch up in a tree and wait whilst all the little critters who are running away from being burnt to death, they run out of the burning bush and then get eaten by these black kites. So... Since 2017, at least in the scientific literature, we're no longer the only animal that can start fires or start fires from existing fires. The, the raptors haven't worked out how to start a fire from a spark yet, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't bet against it. Well, they clearly know what fire does. Uh, they can foresee the benefits of, of spreading the fires. I mean, that's truly remarkable. I, I believe that for many people, when they think of other animals that are clever, uh, other than other primates, of course, they're thinking of dolphins, toothed whales, things like that. And they certainly do show some degree of intelligence in the sense that they can recognize themselves in a mirror, something that your, you know, your dog can't really do. But uh, isn't uh, there something else they do that uh, struck me as very remarkable? They protect their noses when they dive. Tell me about that. Right, right. So this was first observed in the 1980s in uh, Shark Bay in Australia. So bottlenose dolphins, and they have their long rostra, so, which is the beaks or the sort of the nose. And it was observed that a number of dolphins in a, in a large group were swimming down to the bottom and finding conical-shaped sponges and then sort of working them onto their beaks and then using them just as a protection for when they forage down the, the seabed when they're looking for sort of craggy mollusks and crustaceans that, that might scratch up their noses and therefore cause infection. So this is an example of a rare example of one animal using a second animal to catch a third animal. Now, that's only half the story. It's a ridiculously cool story, but it's only half the story because on closer inspection, it turns out that, well, only the females do this. We don't know why that is. We don't see any distinction in sort of reproductive success between the males and the females who sponge and and don't sponge. But then when the genetics of the female sponging dolphins was analysed a few years ago, a couple of years ago, it turned out that these females weren't particularly closely related to each other. And so from that, if you look at the pattern of who is doing this behaviour, it says something very important. So it says that this technique, this tool use using sponges, is what we call cultural transmission. So it's learnt behaviour that is passed on in all directions, a bit like we do all the time in teaching. Whereas a lot of the tool use behaviours we see in other animals is clearly genetically encoded, so it's an innate ability. And then there's even a third amazing thing about these bottlenose dolphins is that by looking at the genetic pattern of who is doing the sponging behaviour, we can actually trace where this behaviour began. And what we've worked out is what the researchers in Shark Bay have worked out is that this behavior originated in a single female dolphin, probably in the middle of the 19th century, about six generations ago. And we, we refer to that individual as sponging Eve. So one day this dolphin got up, worked a 
sponge onto her nose and then from that point on it just spread through the population but not genetically encoded it spread through the population because they they taught it to each other so in fact there's a cultural uh, transmission i mean that there's information passed from one generation to the next not in the dna but by learned behavior yeah we think that's exactly right i mean you've got to have the genetic basis in which to learn that behavior in the first place, which means you have to have the brain capable of processing that. You have to have the musculature and the neural processing to, in order that you can actually do that behavior itself. But it's quite clear that the males have all of those biological, those physiological characteristics in place, but they just don't do it. So judging from the pattern of which of the females do do it, it's not genetically encoded the behavior itself. So that looks like it is learnt or taught. And there is a subtle distinction between those two things, which is not easy to resolve. But it's important in this discussion because it, it is one of the things that humans appear to be just so adept at, is this idea of cultural transmission, whereas it's relatively rare in any other animal. But the point is, and one of the sort of central theses of the book, is that we just do it all the time. We do it with every breath. We're doing it right now. Every time you speak to a bunch of students or every time you speak to someone in the street, you're conveying a bit of information or multiple bits of information, and you're probably not related to that person. And that is cultural transmission. Okay, well, uh, you know, I'm uh, <laughs> kind of uh, getting discouraged here. Is there anything, actually, that humans do that's not approximated by some other animals? Maybe thinking about the future, but it sounds like they do that, too. Well, you are special. I think humans are special. But at the same time, we're indistinguishable from other organisms in terms of our basic biology. And I think that is the thing that I like to celebrate, that human exceptionalism is both paradoxically correct and not correct at the same time. And that's worth exploring without feeling the need to answer that it's one side of the fence or the other. Darwin talked about there being characteristics which differed by degree but not kind. And there are definitely some aspects of human behaviour where we share similarities with other organisms, but they are we're just way further up a spectrum compared to other organisms, and maybe tool use is one of those. What we're doing right now, me and you talking to each other with this level of sophistication... Uh, well, I'll let the listeners be the judge of how sophisticated it is, but the basic process of human communication is so qualitatively different from any other organism that we've ever seen that I think that is a thing which is not different by degree. It is different by kind. Loads of animals communicate. In fact, you know, all organisms communicate to a certain degree. But I do think that speech, language, syntax, grammar, communications, the way we speak is so qualitatively different that that is as near to a unique human characteristic as I'm willing to say. Well, finally, Adam, suppose some person on the tube tomorrow turns to you and asks you, OK, what makes humans really human? And you've only got one stop to answer that. Might you not, you know, <laughs> simply say, look, it's kind of trivial. The very fact that we're sitting around having a conversation about what makes us human is what makes us human. Uh, I have a hard time imagining crows sitting around and asking, well, uh, what makes us a crow? I don't think they have that much to crow about. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe that's all there is. It's just the fact that we're self-aware of the possibility that we're different. I think that is a massive part of it, and it depends how long your tube stop is to do this. But you're absolutely right. We are the only species that has evolved the ability to hold ourselves up to the light and say, you know, are we special? And to give the answer, which is both yes and no. That's the paradox. That's the interesting space to investigate. But I think that there is a sort of central thesis, which is relatively new, which is the emergence of all this behavior. I think, and I argue in the book, is predicated on a behavior which emerged after our populations grew to certain sizes. So we model this using Bayesian models, so mathematical models, but it also is reflected in the archaeology that we see. Every time we see sophisticated tool use or abstract art or figurative art or whatever, every time we see a location on Earth where we have this emergence of modern behaviour, it appears to coincide with population expansion, probably to do with climate change. And what the models are saying is not just that we are communicating, but that we are optimizing the transfer of units of information from individuals to other individuals or 
individuals to other large groups. There's another thing which is worth mentioning, which is that we are a species of experts. So no other species has as uneven distribution of talents as humans have had for tens of thousands of years. So what is the best way to find out how to do something that you don't know how to do? You ask someone who knows how to do it, right? So that appears to be, in the, in the mathematical modeling and the archaeological remains, that appears to be a sort of baseline from which everything else we think of as being uniquely human can emerge. So complex thought, abstract thought, the ability to imagine another person's mind, which is what we're doing right now, along with all of those physical skills like whittling a flute or a, a statue or painting a cave painting or any of those things. I argue that they all sit on top of this baseline event where our populations grew and we became much better, much more efficient at transmitting ideas from one person who knows how to do something to people who don't know how to do it. And I think that that's really the key of our ability to accumulate culture. Adam Rutherford, thanks so very much for having uh, both the inclination and the ability to talk with us today. <laughs> thanks, Seth. It's always a pleasure. Adam Rutherford is a geneticist, and he's the author of Humanimal, How Homo Sapiens Became Nature's Most Paradoxical Creature, A New Evolutionary History. Okay, so we're dependent upon each other as sources of information. Each of us is kind of a single node in a massive matrix of data exchange. And it seems there's great survival value in having membership in Club Homo Sapiens. But let's face it, there's also a downside to being a cog in this giant pulsing human machine. For example, security lines at the airport and sweaty armpits in the subway precisely at nose height. A neuroscientist once said to me, Pat, don't you find it kind of amazing that there aren't more murders? I mean, given how annoying other people could be, if we didn't have these inhibitions about hurting others, there would be more murders. A neural philosopher suggests why we more often play nice than indulge our darker impulses. So don't go anywhere. Let's stick together on Big Picture Science. talking sociability and group behavior on Big Picture Science, why is it that on average we're more into spending time on Facebook than taking a solo walk around Walden Pond? Our overall inclination is to communicate with one another, work together, and more than that, form strong attachments to family, friends, and others in the community. One scientist sums it up by saying, we are wired to care, which may sound pat, but this is the way pat sounds. I'm Pat Churchland. I'm a neural philosopher, so I'm interested in how sciences of the brain intersect with the grand old questions of philosophy. One of those questions involves the origin of moral behavior, because if I look out for your welfare over my own, that might mean fewer benefits go to me. We are social by nature. This is something Aristotle said, but it was also echoed by Darwin. We like to be together. and. We incur a certain cost when we like to be together, and that is we tend not to take advantage of others or we tend not to beat up on others. There is great advantage in being part of a close-knit or even a loose-knit group. As Adam Rutherford said, it allows us to swap useful information, and surely that has adaptive value. But Dr. Churchland says that exchanging information isn't the origin of our stick-togetherness. The real origin had to do with the link between mothers and offspring. And then over evolutionary time, that link of attachment got expanded. But the real question is, why was that link there? Dr. Churchland spells out the origins of that first link, the mother-child bond, 
that if it hadn't been part of the wiring of mothers, would mean that we might not be having this conversation today. Some other creature would be running the planet. Well, yes. And notice, though, that reptiles were doing very well before mammals came along. And reptiles do not typically show parental care of any kind, not mothers, not fathers. The uh, mother lizard will lay her eggs and put some sand over them and off she goes. You will see a garter snake who does give live birth. The snakes come popping out by the 50s and then she just takes off. Ah. So what was different about mammals? That's an interesting question. Is there an answer? I, I may not have asked if I didn't have the answer. <laughs> and I think the answer really kind of changes how we look at evolutionary biology, but in a very Darwinian way. It was all about food. So about 200 million years ago, an amazing change that we don't quite understand took place. And that is this. Warm-blooded creatures emerged on the planet. They were small and they were reptilian, but there they were. Now, what's the good of being warm-blooded? And the answer is, it's huge. Because you can forage at night when all the competition has to sleep and wait for the sun to come up. In fact, you can eat some of that competition because they're too sluggish to run away. Being warm-blooded was an incredible advantage. Okay, so it was the fact that they could take advantage of half the day when the competition, or if you will, the lunch, I guess it would be midnight snack. It would be your midnight snack. <laughs> right. That they, they were all sort of laying around, not, trying not to lose too much body heat. That's what gave mammals their big advantage? I mean, that's well, kind of odd. there's a few more steps to the story. So the story goes like this. While it was a huge benefit to be warm-blooded, there was a huge cost as there often is in biology. And the cost is that gram for gram, a warm-blooded animal has to eat 10 times as much as its cold-blooded cousins. That is an enormous constraint on the survival and the prosperity of the warm-blooded animal. So how are we going to ensure that these warm-blooded animals survive? Things happen, fur was invented. But the other thing that happened is Mother Nature realized that being smart would be a huge advantage. Now, there's really two ways to be smart if you're a biological creature. One is that your species can wait over long, long periods of time for the right mutation to happen so you know something. The other thing, which is much faster, is that each organism can learn. And it can, as it were, tune itself up to the environment. So that's one step, but that's not the end of the story. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'm smart okay. enough to, smart enough to wait for the, the end of this Are story, you? I guess. <laughs> okay. All right. So one of the things that happened was that we got this amazing neural structure called cortex. And all mammals have it. No non-mammals have it. And it interfaces in this really rich way with all those ancient subcortical structures that reptiles and amphibians and all the rest have. But the problem is that if you're going to be really smart by learning a huge amount, your brain has to be super immature when you're born. Because when neurons learn, they build structure, they sprout here and there and all over the place. And if you're not very immature, you can't learn very much. So mammalian babies began to be born more and more immature. Now that's great if you're gonna be a big learner. That's not so great for the babies because you're vulnerable. So now what mother nature did over millions of years of evolution was to rewire the brain so that the mother would have the passion to stay with the infant, and just as she takes care of her own food and warmth and safety, she takes care of the food and warmth and safety of the offspring. And attachment means that the emotions are hugely involved, that every parent knows this, every human parent knows this. 
that attachment brings these tremendously powerful emotions. And that really was nature's way of ensuring that if you're going to be warm-blooded, you got to be smart. And if you're going to be smart, you're going to be immature when you're born. So you better have somebody take care of you. And that was the beginning of this very different pattern of sociality that we see in mammals that we don't see in termites. Okay. Now, let me see if I can sort of summarize this scenario. That is that in order to be smart, we had to be born immature, and that meant somebody had to take care of us, and uh, the logical uh, uh, candidate for that was the the person who gave birth to us. <laughs> that's right. Right? She's handy. She's right there. She is right there. That's for sure. And uh, as a result, you develop these very strong mother-child bonds. Okay. Probably the strongest bonds of love in the whole human yes. experience, I believe. I think so. But how did that spread to, you know, the kind of moral behavior that, to some extent, permeates all of humankind? Morality isn't anything mystical and magical. Morality is incurring a cost to yourself in order to benefit another, in its simplest version. And what the mother does, of course, is incur a tremendous cost in convenience, in her own safety, often in her own food, in order to care for the offspring. Now that you've got this wonderful attachment wiring in place, you can make small genetic changes in animals so that they are attached not just to their infants, but to their kin or to their mates or to their friends and so forth. And so it's in that way that you get this extension of care from immediate family to friends, the wider community, and sometimes even to strangers. So is this willingness to treat other people in a, a moral way, whatever moral means in this case, is that due to chemicals in our brains? Is it because of something like dopamine or whatever? Or is it just the wiring of our brains that's responsible? It's always a combination of the wiring which are sort of cables of neurons, and how those neurons talk to each other. That, and they talk to each other by using chemicals. And there are several that are very important that link our cortex to our subcortex. But the most prominent one, and one you will have heard a lot about, is oxytocin. It's a pleasure chemical, is it not? I mean, do, do we actually enjoy moral behavior? Oxytocin isn't actually associated with pleasure. It's associated with attachment. But here's the kind of cool thing. The wiring is such that those neurons that release oxytocin talk to neurons that release endocannabinoids, yes, and endocannabinoids along with opioids that your brain makes do give you feelings of pleasure. But Pat, humans are also able to uh, behave truly awfully to one another. <laughs> What's the deal there? I mean, have they just gone wrong, bad brain wiring, or is this just uh, evolution experimenting with other kinds of behavior? No, I think it's a very deep question. And I think the answer is very straightforward. And that is that the wiring for self-care every single creature on the face of the planet has, where we see to our own food and warmth and safety, never goes away. It's not that once you begin to care for others, you no longer care for yourself. It's really rather that now there is a great complication in the decision-making of these species, these mammalian species, and that is they both care for themselves, but they also care for others. And now sometimes they will sacrifice themselves, sometimes they won't. And this is in a way, if you want to take a simplified view of it, what so many of the great, great stories and legends are all about, is how we negotiate these competing impulses where we want something for ourselves, but we may have to suppress it in order to achieve a more social goal. Patricia Churchland, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. 
Pat Churchland is a neurophilosopher, a professor emerita of philosophy at the University of California, San Diego, and she is the author most recently of Conscience, The Origins of Moral Intuition. So what she's saying here is that the care that we extend to one another in growing concentric circles, our family, our friends, and our community, is an extension of the mother-child bond. Well, if we didn't care for one another, then, you know, urban societies wouldn't be possible. I mean, if you were constantly fighting your neighbors or killing them, obviously we wouldn't be living in cities. Everybody would have a tent in Montana. And if that were the case, I mean, we wouldn't do the really civilized things like, I don't know, making movies or research labs or or having symphony orchestras. Coming up, we want you to picture your family tree. Perhaps now you are seeing your mother, your father, grandparents, uncles. Don't forget your ants. Certain species of ants have societies that can grow to any size, and we don't see that anywhere else in nature. Well, never mind hirsute primates. The animal that may most resemble human social behavior may be an insect. Next, let's stick together on Big Picture Science. Biologist Mark Moffat spent two years in the rainforests of Asia doing research for his PhD. Afterwards, he went on to explore most of the other tropical forests of the world. That made him, according to his professor, the renowned Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson, a wandering naturalist in the tradition of Darwin and Wallace. Dr. Moffat has seen a lot of exotic critters doing strange and astonishing things, but one of the most extraordinary things by a primate, no less, Dr. Moffat has encountered closer to home. One of the most remarkable things humans do is walk into a cafe. And even though there are strangers there, we don't want to kill everyone or run away in terror or at least walk up to each of them and find out who they are. That would be impossible for a chimpanzee. Chimpanzees don't tolerate strangers in their society. They couldn't withstand a cafe full of strange chimpanzees. And yet we do it all the time. Hundreds and thousands of strangers pass us every day and nothing bad happens. This is a remarkably simple thing, but it distinguishes us from many other vertebrate animals. We're talking about how we evolved into highly social animals, forming intimate bonds with one another and with our extended community in this episode of Big Picture Science, and now why those social groups can grow and grow exponentially. A cafe with 50 people in a town of 150,000 is one thing, but more than a million and a half call the city of Philadelphia home. More than eight and a half million crowd the boroughs of New York, and the most populous country in the world, China, is home to 1.4 billion people. Now, we're not saying that living together in great numbers means living trouble-free, but on average, it's fairly smooth sailing. I mean, we cooperate. And one reason, says Dr. Moffat, is that humans are willing to accept anonymity in public spaces. One reason anonymity is important to us is that it reduces the load on our brains. We do not have to think of everyone all the time. In a way, a chimpanzee has to constantly be keeping track of what's going on, who's who. Humans don't. We move through the world and almost never have to think about anyone else. It's somewhat paradoxical. I mean, we are highly social and in each other's business all the time, swapping information, collaborating, raising families, and being intimate in all sorts of ways. But we are also willing to completely ignore each other, not just in a cafe, 
almost everywhere. And because of our ability to ignore one another, the animal that Dr. Moffat thinks is most instructive when we look at large-scale group behavior is not the chimpanzee or bonobo, but the insect that comes uninvited to your kitchen and picnic. Individual ants don't give a hoot about one another, but groups of this industrious insect can achieve great things, and that indifference to one another allows groups to grow like mad. The Argentinian ant, for example, forms super colonies. Mark Moffat's book is The Human Swarm, How Our Societies Arise, Thrive, and Fall. Well, Mark, you say that the emergence of our ability to do this, something as simple as walking into a cafe and order a cup of coffee and just quietly sit by ourselves if we wish, marks a pivotal moment in human evolution that you say has been underappreciated. And I wonder if you could elaborate. Well, there's been a lot of focus on cooperation in societies, but if you look around societies, you'll find a lot of people don't cooperate. Your worst enemy, for example, can be in your society. And And what I've been focusing on is what I think really defines societies, and that's a sense of belonging. It's a sense of identity, and that's something that biologists haven't looked at. And that identity has allowed humans to bring in or add strangers to their societies. And that in itself made it possible for our societies to grow huge. There are other animals that live in large groups, sometimes very large groups. I'm thinking of fish and birds. Are they considered societies? Why aren't they societies? Why don't we say a society of birds just flew over? Well, there is an intriguing species of bird that has societies that fly over, but most flocks of birds, like huge groups of wandering wildebeest, don't belong to that group. They can come and go freely. There's no sense of membership there. And so without that, there's really no closure that gives that the basis of calling that group a society. And so there aren't different herds of uh, wildebeest that have different memberships in one place or another. There's just a mass of wildebeest that happen to travel together because it serves the interests of them all. It may surprise people that the animals you compare us to are not other primates. They aren't chimpanzees. What is the similarity between human society and ants? Well, uh, ants share with us something that's remarkable because it allows them to have these vast societies too. Certain species of ants have societies that can grow to any size, and we don't see that anywhere else in nature. So there can be what are called super colonies of ants that can grow to billions of individuals. And what they do to make that possible is have some kind of shared feature that they recognize on each other and see that they belong. And for them, this national anthem is a scent. If you smell right, you're golden. And you can add more and more individuals to your society, to your ant colony, as long as they have that national emblem. And it sounds like, well, perhaps this anthem is really more an anthem. Well, anthem is exactly what it is. (laughs) A a super smart ant would be very pleased by that idea, Molly. Ants are very alien to us in many ways. But the parallels between us are manifest. I mean... uh, No chimpanzee has ever developed highways and infrastructure, has complex division of labor, worked in assembly lines and had complicated teams, has developed agriculture and mass warfare. But ants have to do these things all the time. It has little to do with their intelligence. It has a lot to do with the fact that some ant colonies can grow very large. Well, as you talk about human societies and ant societies, and both can grow to be quite enormous, a super colony of ants can be a billion members, I think you said, but there seems to be this balance between remaining anonymous, which we need to be so we can walk into a cafe and no one pays attention to us, but also recognizing who's in and who's out, so also being recognized as a member of a group. And can you say more about how ants recognize who's in and who's out and how humans do it? Well, ants do it through this scent, this national anthem. The really interesting thing is that humans do it in more ways than you could believe. In fact, uh, in the book, I describe humans as walking billboards for their identities. 
because virtually every gesture we make, every move, everything about our bodies is absorbed as we move past people. We bring these things into our brains and feel comfortable with those people in the room. The fact is we are seeing things in each other that are very hard to appreciate because we don't even know we're seeing them. There's a researcher, Abigail Marsh, down in Georgetown University, who has shown, for example, that from a great distance, the average American can pick out other Americans by their walk or the way they wave their hand from, say, an Australian. And you won't be able to say how you did it. It's just something that you've taken in. Another one of her examples is you can show someone a picture of someone of Japanese ancestry, and you won't be able to say anything about them. But if they're smiling, surprisingly often, people can uh, surmise that the person is Japanese or American. They can tell the two nationalities apart. And we all seem to smile the same way, but in truth, we don't, it appears. We use slightly different muscles, apparently, depending on where we grew up. So we're assessing all these subtle details, and this traces back to hunter-gatherer days where societies were much smaller and yet differed from one society to the next. Are ants members of multiple groups? I mean, are there sort of like the core family and then the larger society? Can an ant have many memberships? No, ants keep it simple. Ants are nationalists to the core. They are focused entirely at the society level. Their colony is everything to them. They don't even keep track of individuals. The fact that we're spending all our mental energy remembering all our friends and the relationships we have with everybody would seem absurd to an ant. Why aren't you just getting the job done properly? But humans, uh, our big brains really have very little to do with the society level issues of identity that I was talking about. They have grown large mostly to handle these relationships within our society. Our friendships and bosses and other things, those burn up the calories. Ants, as you said, I mean, they get the job done and they're highly organized. And I, I wonder if you could talk about some ants that you've met and the kind of extraordinary things that you've seen them do when they put their antennae together. <laughs> well, there are uh, good things and bad things they do from the human perspective of morality. One is that ants are warmongers. These large-scale battles really emerge when societies get very big. And so humans and ants both started to develop extreme forms of warfare as nations, in the case of humans, got well beyond, say, 10,000 or even to 100,000 level. Those huge ant colonies in California have the largest battlefields ever recorded, going on for miles, and a million ants can die every week. Well, what, is this, so, what does this look like, ant warfare? I mean, do you see one brown ant on, on the left and darker ants on the right, and then they just go at each other like some of those big-budget Hollywood movies? <laughs> well, there are some very cool examples. There's an ant out in the southwest that keeps other ants from forging by dropping pebbles down their hole so that they can't emerge. But in the case of these very large-scale warfares, the ants simply go at it. They seem to be willing to kill themselves at a moment's notice. And what they do, they don't have guns or anything. Uh, they simply start grabbing onto each other and pulling each other apart. You also met an army of an army of army ants in Nigeria, um, also a super colony, and you've watched them organize into something productive. And what were they trying to do? Well, the army ants are awesome. <laughs> I love army ants. I look for them wherever I go. Army ants are a great example of how ants get things done because ants don't have leaders. They put together these raids that can contain millions of ants, more than 100 feet wide in a dense swarm, and none of the ants know what's going on. There's no ant and mini helicopter flying overhead trying to tell the rest of them where to go, and yet the raid follows the best course to get the most food. And what happens is everyone contributes a little. Everyone gives a bit of information about where they're finding food and so forth, and this information percolates through the swarm, and the swarm responds in aggregate where there's the most excitement, and it moves in the right direction all the time. 
And what, what might they be raiding? You know, what's a food source for a super colony? Is it, a I don't know, a small cow or is it a, 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 tr- well, a shrub? Well, what the army ants are going for is anything they can catch. They will swarm into other ant colonies and kill them off and take their young. They will eat frogs and lizards. And in Africa, they will even kill mammals that can't get away. That's one reason why you don't tie up your cow if you live in equatorial Africa and why you don't put babies in cribs. They're on your back because these army ants of Africa have little knife blade jaws and they can cut flesh and there are lots of them. Societies are very effective when they're large because there's a lower cost per individual in a large city compared to a small town, for example. And so large societies end up with an excess labor force that they can put to use. And the ants put them to use pretty much entirely for warfare. Humans, at least, have other options. We can do radio shows. We can have the arts. We can have the sciences. We can have sports things that no ant would dream of. And the fact that we can create alliances between societies that are synergistic and allow for the flowering of all sorts of creativity is something that distinguishes us certainly from the ants and from just about any other animal. Are we sure that ants don't dream? Do ants sleep? Well, we don't know if they dream, but they do sleep. Ants sleep for about five seconds a time, a couple hundred (laughs) times a day. (laughs) So they're taking little mini, mini cat naps. Same with the honeybees. Those are power naps. Whether they're dreaming or not, I don't know. Well, finally, Mark, as you draw these comparisons between human societies and ant societies, you also talk about and write about the fall of societies. And I wonder if when you observe ant societies, if the future of human societies is foretold by the ants, Well, one thing I've seen as I've gone through the whole animal kingdom, just to speak more broadly, is that societies are temporary. All of them across species go through a cycle of some kind. And uh, Jared Diamond talks about these massive calamities that brought down certain societies, but even without those kinds of calamities, societies come and go. And throughout species, this is a matter of turning the familiar into the foreign, changes in identity that cause societies to break up. And how those changes occur is a real central mystery that I think we need to address because it affects us and it affects every other species that has societies. And what causes this transformation is really little known. Mark Moffitt, what a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for joining us. You're perfect. It's been wonderful to be here, Molly, and I hope to be part of this again. Mark Moffitt is a tropical biologist and Smithsonian Institution researcher and the author of The Human Swarm, How Our Societies Arise, Thrive, and Fall. So overall in this show, we've come across a few ideas of why we stick together. One of them is the information network is very useful to all of us, but that's not the only reason. The mother-child bond, which was, of course, necessary for the survival of the babies, has extended to other members of society. I mean, that didn't have to happen that way, but it did. And as a consequence, we care about strangers. We leave them alone. We don't go out and try and kill them all because they're possible competitors. And that's allowed us, of course, to build civilizations. Well, the other part of that is the paradox. So we care about each other, and yet we also are indifferent to each other in just the right balance that our societies can grow to be quite enormous the way that an ant society would, and individual ants don't really care much about each other. Indeed, but the question I would have is, well, how much bigger can we get? I mean, we're at the level of ants now. The the super colonies there are billions. We are billions. What happens when we get to a trillion humans spread over this part of the solar system? Will we still care about one another?
We can't think of a better group to work with than senior producer Gary Niederhoff, assistant producer Sarah Derwin, and operations manager Barbara Vance. I am executive producer of Big Picture Science, Molly Bentley. Thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit education and research organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including future expeditions to the moon. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer, Seth Shostak, and personally, I like people, generally speaking. Also, a big thanks to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science that is called Let's Stick Together. And if you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find past episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org, and our website has links to the guests you heard. You may be listening to our radio show on broadcast, but did you know that we're also a podcast? And you can make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to the PyPySci podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, or Himalaya. 